keynote address is going to be delivered by Marit. Marit, you have already met at the beginning. Suffice to say that Marit is a nurse, an anesthesiologist, and an emergency physician in a place where emergency medicine has only existed for four years as a distinct speciality. Please welcome Marit. Well, after that performance, uh, this is going to be a little bit more boring. <laughs> and you don't have to move that much either. I would like to start by thanking you all. It has been great three days, and I've learned so much. And I've already given my cards to a bunch of people, hoping that we can have collaboration with my people from home. And uh, it's been really, really good. So clinician knowledge and leader, this topic really gave me a stress, and I didn't know what to talk about. So um, give me feedback if I talked at all about the right things. I picked up some things from yesterday and the day before, and this is one that I really liked from one of the presentations. We have been celebrating 50 years of emergency medicine, uh, meaning that physicians have actually been in the ED for 50 years. That doesn't mean that nurses haven't been there even longer. And I usually show this uh, picture when I want to talk about how important doctors actually are. We have started from having only one task, and that's to have an afternoon tea with the senior nurse. Not much to to have around. So you guys have actually been there for a lot longer than, than us. The role of, of your existence, though, have changed very, very much. From being people that couldn't even get married, at least in Finland, lived their whole life living also in hospitals, to actually people that translate best research evidence uh, uh, to, to really for the good of the patients, and as uh, Friends from the Congress says nurses are central. Gautam Bodivala was one of the IFEM uh, heads uh, for many years, and he was lecturing last year in Finland. And I thought about what, what does it mean saying clinician knowledge is a leader? And I then thought that, OK, knowledge is something that we create by having science also, not only, but also. So, Gautam has said that the clinician is that medicine, but nursing is as well. It's not a book, but mind, not a business, but life. And I really think that is that. A researcher is an innovator, she who sees what everybody has seen, but think what nobody else has thought. And that's a little bit different from being the one that cares about the patient by the bed. And then who's the leader? One who keeps an eye on the horizon, not on the bottom line. So we need clinicians to actually translate evidence to stuff that we can use in patient care. And we all want to have evidence-based care, but we need people there that helps us say what that evidence-based care is. And it's changing all the time. Today is not at all best care in like two years. And if you're old enough, you know how in the old days, we opened up everybody's stomach to take out their gallbladder. If I would do that today, I would be prosecuted for, you know, whatever. So the, the, the world is really changing fast. And that's why I think that the nurse, clinician, scientist is needed there to just tell us what to do. John Tusson is one of the leading lean thinkers in the world, and I just heard him last week. And what we also need leaders for is that when you're actually taking care of your patients, you're kind of in the process. And if it's a bad process, you're do you don't always see what is bad in the process. And I think at least Margaret has said it many times during these days, that you, you need to be above the process and actually see a little bit from an outside helicopter perspective. And that's a leader in one sense. 
we talk about patient safety and leadership uh, is a crucial element in, in patient safety because it's usually system errors, not like one person errors. And I picked this up from one of the desks outside Clinical Excellence Commission that very nicely says that all clinicians are leaders in some capacity. And I'm going to talk about that capacity a little bit later. But it also says that, that there's a new generation of clinical leaders. It's not only to lead the gang that gives care, it's also to take the new evidence into the care and see that it's practiced in the best way. And as, as the bubble says, we spend too much time fixing people who are not broken and not enough time fixing organizational systems that are broken. And we've heard many good lectures about that. Kate with the trauma, kids. It's, it's really a lot about systems and not so much about individuals. Of course, individuals are making the system. So what is knowledge? Knowledge and, and research actually makes the profession. Like emergency medicine, when we started in Finland, uh, it actually started by appointing a professor. Because the, the specialty doesn't live if you don't have research. And it's the same for nursing, of course. From 1947, I found an article saying that nursing knowledge is knowing what the patient wants before the nurse is asked. Of course, that's something we should also do today. But today, nursing is so much more. Uh, and, and at least in Finland, some of the nurse, nurses do tasks that used to be doctor's tasks. And that's totally OK. We have uh, two kinds of knowledge. We have practical knowledge, and we have theoretical knowledge. And then we actually have something that has been up very much during these days which was a little bit new to me, is these uh, things about human behavior. Before I came, it was clear that the lean thinkers in, in Helsinki talked a lot about the fact that a person with knowledge is not anymore the, the one that you seek for. It's the person with humanity's knowledge that you actually seek for. So it means that the central to successful implementation is changing human behavior. And that's more and more important in, in what we do today. We've talked about definitions. And I've tried to find um, a definition for uh, clinician, science, research, da, da, da. There was a ton of different uh, definitions. This picture I've taken in, in uh, Seattle in the States. And if somebody would tell me what a honey bucket is, this is not what I would think about. So you just need to define what you actually mean when you talk about stuff. So I'm going to use different wordings because of the articles that I read actually use these wordings that I'm going to use. So what is a clinician scientist? A clinician with the knowledge to then become a leader. Their scientific questions arise at the bedside and in the clinic. And it's like I just heard Julie. Uh, tell a young man that you need to have one question, and that question needs to be something that pisses you off every day because you're so annoyed that you don't know the answer or you feel that you're not doing the exact right thing. So that's where the most important uh, uh, questions for our patients actually comes from, the bedside. And then I've heard many of you say that a necessary shift in perspective and identity from that of the practice expert to the research scientist. And that I've seen that can be very, very hard, that you are an expert in, in nursing practice. And then when you start to uh, be one that also wants to do science and research, and then you're a novice at the same time. And that's a tough role to have an expertise in something and then be a beginner in, in something else. And that many of my PhD students really struggle with. Bridge from directly participating in patient care to generate knowledge influencing patient care. It's a, it's a very different role that you, that you take. And uh, here are some of the problems that these uh, uh, writers of this article uh, wrote about, that the role description is not actually combined 
practice and, and research. And I've heard here now that you, at least the ones in this Congress, pretty much have the possibility to work clinically and also do research. In Finland, you still kind of end up being a administer or, or a teacher at the nursing school. And we very seldom see people actually in the clinic. And I think the, the problems are because if, if you're only academic, you kind of get professional isolation, which is not very good. The, you're devaluing the original commitment to practice. We actually train to become nurses taking care of patients. And that's the, the, like the bottom line. And sometimes we feel that those that are not doing that anymore are like, you know, giving up on the role of nurses. And we don't really, at least in Finland, really see yet how important it is that we have those that actually have the, the both roles. Insecure funding, oh my God, research is always like that. And then we also heard, I think it was Margaret again saying that you really always want uh, positive outcomes. That, that, that you have like this drive of publishing and it's easier to publish if the outcome is, is positive. We should kind of also see that it's equally important to give the negative feedback on don't do this because this was not good for the patient. And I hope that the journals are getting that. And orientation to doing. It's hard to just sit in a room and, and, and analyze something and, and be very intellectual when your basic training is to be hands-on with patients. So what's the future? I hope it's bright. Uh, I think this was one of the nicest things that I found from these three days, saying that knowledge changes clinicians and clinicians change practice. And this doesn't only go for researchers. This goes for everybody. Uh, Butch Holtz and, and, and friends, they actually divide uh, a nurse to one that is doing like a practical scholarship and then one that's doing the theoretical, the research scholarship. I don't know if it's good or bad, but I'm sure that we also need people not doing maybe their own research, but being there uh, telling us what the research is about. Because there's a lot of papers that are total crap. They are underpowered. They are uh, written in, in, in a funny way. And we need people uh, that translate the, the knowledge so that we can use it in, in our work. Uh, one very important thing is uh, to identify healthcare knowledge gaps. And at least the ILCOR work that Julie and I are doing, they very much focus on what's the gaps in, in the knowledge that we have about resuscitation. And there's many papers coming out now from different uh, groups talking about the gaps. And using knowledge uh, derived from research to resolve problems in order to advance clinical practice, that's actually very important. And a nurse who has the knowledge can be the one that leads the way in the application into practice. And that needs some other skills than just uh, nurse training. So the USA College of Nursing says that the nursing practice scholar, the one that actually is not so much creating new knowledge, but synthesizing the knowledge there is, is accountable as a clinical leader to translate implement the interventions, evaluating outcomes, and integrating best practices. And we've heard very good uh, lectures here about how important it is not to just say that, OK, here's a score, do it. But you also have to see how it is actually used and implemented to be sure that it's giving the best care for the patients. So knowledge generation alone is insufficient. You need careful translation uh, so that you don't harm. And it has to be sustainable. It's not only putting in uh, and being done with it, but it's to see that it continues to give good care, the things that you implement. I didn't find an article. I know it's there. There's an article actually showing that a hospital or many, many hospitals that had nurse scientists working actually uh, uh, had, those hospitals had better outcome and survival 
which is, is crucial. And I've been, you know, sending that article to my bosses uh, to, to get them to see that we really need to work to get nurses to do research more than they do today in Finland. I have over 600 nurses and I have only one uh, that's doing PhD. And I hope that Julian, Judy is going to change that and Kate when you come. It's about teamwork. You can't do research without teams. You can't do good care without teams. And uh, sometimes we act like like uh, we are the only ones uh, doing something. And ED is usually in the hospital, the place that everything is dumped into. And I'm trying to say that that boat is the hospital. And the ED cannot be the only one shuffling water. You need to help us there. And this goes to everything we do. And that's why I've been more and more lately talking about not only leaders, but followers. And knowledge to a nurse also means that you as a follower of a leader may then be a, a, a medical doctor or a, or a nurse a leader, that you need to have the knowledge to stand up and say, I don't think this is going the right way. This is a study uh, made on, on um, uh, doctors. There were 36 instances with 18 participants, and they actually simulated a, a case where the doctor was almost putting a pleural drainage into the wrong side of the chest. So obviously, a mistake. And, and 94 knew that there was about to happen. But only 20 of those 36 instances were actually challenged, which is pretty scary. And from my life, I have had a story from Oulu where two orthopedic surgeons were trying to figure out how to use a defibrillator. And a nurse student was actually standing next to the machine, and she would have known exactly how to use it. But she did not stand up and say, please go away, I know what to do. Because of the hierarchy, because of like these guys, they asked these doctors, why didn't you do it? Oh, you know, not to, sh to seem stupid, or, or uh, I wasn't really sure. Well, uh, we've also heard many uh, studies that has, have been disseminated and implemented. And I didn't know that WHO actually has kind of a statement saying that you need to disseminate your uh, study results in 12 months. And then also consider how the study findings influence clinical practice already when you kind of plan the study not when you have the results there. And then my favorite thing is culture of excellence, because that's what we thrive for in resuscitation now. So we may accept the substandard work product because it's easier. Uh, and if you always do what you always done, you always get what you always got. And that's where we need nurses with research science and knowledge to be leaders of a change so that we always done it that way will not stand anymore. And people saying that will never work. It might not work, but you may try it and then say, oh, it didn't work. And then check your ego at the door. I, I at least has a lot of neurosurgeons and orthopedics that I would like to say that to. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like emergency medicine. So one of the major things you can do with knowledge and being persistent is that, that you take the current culture in where you work to a desired culture, which is a culture of excellence. And it's, by definition, something out of ordinary. So you need to step out that little, do something more than I did today. And it's a choice and a commitment. And actually, Dr. Seuss, as you saw, he has said it quite nicely. This is something that I would like you to sometimes look at from the YouTube. Richard St. John, three minutes. He says, what you need to success to do the extraordinary as a clinician with knowledge and a leadership. 
You need to have passion, we've heard about that. You need to work hard. You need to focus. One question with one research, research in this field and taking it all the way. You need a push. You push yourself mentally. You push your colleagues. Richard says, that's why we inf invented mothers, to push us harder. You need to have ideas, and you need to be in a culture that you can come up with ideas freely, with the state of mind that I want to improve. And you have to be very persistent. And now this is, Julie, for you. You have to also tolerate <laughs> crap, criticism, rejection, assholes, and pressure. So don't give up. <laughs> yeah, and we've also heard many say that, that you need to feel comfortable with yourself. You need to be taking care of yourself because you get excited about others if you feel good yourself. And I have um, had a day, uh, we call it the happiness day. Once a summer, I invite some of my friends. We all have a medal, that's Sean Dark that my PhD students gave me. We put the medal on in the morning, we drink champagne all day, and we only talk about things that makes us very, very happy. <laughs> Thank you.